I don't think I'm on. There we go. <laughs> you say, I don't think I'm on, but all of a sudden we are. So we um, appear to be having a little bit of streaming difficulty again today. We did have Mediacom come out and look at um, the equipment and stuff this week, so I'm not sure what may be happening up there, but we want to thank our technical team, Chris and Ren and Liz. You guys don't see them up there from your vantage point, but I get to see them every week, and they are always diligent, busy working, and um, helping to bring the service to you and to those who are viewing online. So we really are appreciative of all the time and energy that they put forth. Uh, you don't see sometimes when you drive by, Chris's car is here often, just making sure things are up and running appropriately. So we are really happy and thankful for all the ministry that they give to the church, for sure. Um, from the bulletin today, the mission for April continues to be our food pantry. And you usually see those reports in the update as to how many families that we're serving and how that is going. We also just express our uh, sincere appreciation to the food pantry team. They're here week in and week out every Tuesday serving and busy. And um, I know Sandy does a lot of shopping and things outside of just Tuesday afternoons. So there's a lot of unsung heroes in the church that don't, not everyone sees, but that are really serving our community. And we're so appreciative of that. Is there anything else that needs to be brought before the congregation today? I do know that the uh, committee that's working on the garage sale is asking people to begin to think about that. I know I have been trying to downsize and clean out closets and things and uh, getting ready for the garage sale. So I don't uh, recall the date if that's in the bulletin. I'm missing that at first glance, but it is in August. So just start thinking about things that you might be able to donate and bring to that. In my uh, devotional reading this morning, I'm uh, on my way through the New Testament and finished up the first four chapters of Hebrews in this past week. And it just made me think about some of the reasons why we come together on Sundays. It's way more than just a habit. It's more than just what we do. But we're here to uh, worship God through song, to turn our hearts and our attention toward him and the gift of redemption and salvation that he offers to us. We do that through song. We gather together to hear the word of God read and preached and then to study it together in our Sunday school classes. And we come together to encourage each other in our faith. I hope that there are conversations around the table center on uh, things that you've heard, what God has done in your life over the past week uh, during fellowship and Sunday school time. And so we gather for those three reasons, to turn our hearts toward God, to hear his word proclaimed, and to keep each other going in our faith as we serve God together. So this is a, just the last couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And our opening hymn today, number 372, kind of asks some of those same questions. Why are we here? How can we know that our sins are forgiven? How can we know that we can walk confidently with the Lord? And this is a good Wesley hymn, uh, been with us since 1749, and it asks and answers the question, how can we sinners know? It's number 372, we'll sing the first four verses, and I invite you to stand if you are able.
us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that we can know that our sins are forgiven, that the Spirit gives us proof and confidence through that conviction in our hearts that we have been born again. We thank you, Lord, that you have applied your blood to us and that the Heavenly Father sees the righteousness of Christ when he looks for us at us, sinful though we might be. So we thank you, Lord, and we come to worship you today with open hearts to receive what you would have for us and to encourage one another in this walk of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ask you to be seated, and if the kiddos would like to come up front for children's time, that would be awesome. Why don't you sit right here so I can see your faces? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> sit down right here so I can see your faces. That would be great. Good morning. It's good to see you all. We almost don't have enough room for everybody. <laughs> good to have you all with us this morning. Well, um, today... Um, I'm going to be talking to the adults about something important. Have you ever seen anything like this? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, what is it? Um, it's something where you um, write about your birthday. Yeah, it's an invitation to a party, uh, your birthday or some other big event. And so, uh, have you ever gotten one of these? To go to somebody's birthday party? <laughs> you, you send them to, but when you have your own birthday party, you send them to friends, right? So, um, let me ask you this. If, if you um, knew that uh, a friend was having a birthday party and everybody else in the class was invited but you, how would you feel? I yeah, I would feel sad too, because um, if especially if it's a friend and that they didn't invite you, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be nice. And and you know um, sometimes people will send invitations to people who are just like them, and so that might leave you out. Or um, maybe they invite their rich friends because they can get better presents. And bring better presents. So there's lots of reasons why people might not invite us. But you know, there's good news. I'm going to be talking to the adults this morning about um, Jesus giving us an invitation. And he gives an invitation to everybody. Everybody can, can come to kind of his party. And... and yeah. So what, what he's inviting us to is to be with him, to, to be saved from our sins, and to follow him, and to be with God forever. Uh, and, and so that's a party. Um, that it, it says in the Bible that heaven has this big party every time somebody comes to Jesus. They throw a big party. And so um, when you came to Jesus, then um, they had that party just like anybody else. So, remember, Jesus invites you to be with him. Well, yeah, because they welcome them into heaven. Yeah. So, um, remember, that Jesus invites everybody, not just, not just you, but your friends and um, even your enemies to come and to be with him forever. We just have to accept the invitation because uh, at the bottom of this invitation it says RSVP. And that means please respond. So uh, you have to send back the, the invitation or a card um, to say that you're coming. And so we have to do the same thing with what Jesus. We have to tell him we're coming. Well, that would hurt their feelings. And that would hurt Jesus' feelings if you said he didn't want to come. So, yeah, Jesus says, 
please come. And he hopes that we will, and we, that we'll always follow him. So, yeah. So let, let's pray. Well, thank you, God, for all his children today. It's um, very encouraging, and it's good to see their bright faces. Uh, and I thank you that you invite all of us, uh, rich and poor and popular and unpopular and all uh, the people uh, in the world, you invite to be with you. And I pray that uh, people will in accept your invitation and follow Jesus all the way to you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming today. I think Amy's over there. Our scripture passage today comes from Romans chapter 10, where we continue our study in that wonderful book. This is verses 5 through 13 from Romans chapter 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is the word of the Lord, and this we believe. Well, I'm, I'm told that as I adjust in my hearing, uh, that I uh, need to talk a little louder uh, because uh, I hear myself much louder now. So I've been talking the last couple of weeks uh, a little more softly. Um, so uh, my wife will probably let me know uh, if she can't hear, and that may help you hear a little bit better. Uh, we'll do. We'll, we'll keep growing together, right? As we as we figure this out. Well, Augusta National Golf Club in Augusta, Georgia, is an exclusive golf club. It is the home of the Masters Tournament, one of the four men's major championships in professional golf. Augusta National has about 300 members at any given time, and membership is by invitation only. There's no membership application process. With Augusta National, uh, you don't call them, they call you. And membership is believed to cost between $100,000 and $300,000. And in 2020, the estimated dues were just under $30,000 a year. Uh, now, as I look out over the congregation and I consider my own situation, I don't think any of us are going to be members of Augusta National anytime soon. Uh, because you have to have money and you have to have prestige in order to become a member of Augusta National Golf Club. The Jewish faith in uh, the Apostle Paul's day um, and before was much like Augusta National. The Jews uh, were an exclusive organization. They were God's chosen people. And in order to be a part of God's chosen people, you had to be a descendant of Abraham. 
And if you weren't a descendant of Abraham, you, there was a way in uh, for the Gentiles, but the Gentiles had to become like Jews, which meant that they had to, uh, the males had to be circumcised for one thing, and you had to follow all the Jewish festivals and all um, the Jewish religious traditions. And you had to commit to that. And even then, Gentiles weren't permitted in the, in the uh, more inner parts of the temple. You had to be outside in the Gentile area. So you didn't get the full membership benefits if you were Gentile. Membership and privileges were not granted to just anyone. Now, Christianity is different from Augusta National and from the Jewish religion. Salvation and membership are available to all who accept the invitation that Jesus sends to follow him, to be saved from their sins, and to come to God through him. And our scripture text this morning shows us that when it comes to the opportunity for salvation, Jews and Gentiles are on level ground. It's not Jews up here. It's not Gentiles down here. They're both level before the cross. Now, Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 4, which we read last week, reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Uh, now, this is a hinge verse. This, this, this connects what we read last week to what we are going to consider this week. Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through uh, chapter 10, verse 3, considers what it means to, uh, for Christ to be the end of the law from a negative perspective. The Jews believed that they had a position of privilege because they had the law. They were the people of God. They believed that they could attain righteousness by doing their best to keep the law. They knew they didn't do it perfectly, but they were doing their best. They didn't realize that God never intended for the law to be uh, their way to him. There, it was never intended to be the way to righteousness. The law was intended to show people how far short they fell from God's standard. There's, there's no way we can reach God's standard simply by trying hard. The law was intended to show people how far short they had fallen from the standard of righteousness and to point them then to their need for Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus that they needed, but they, but they should have known that at least that it was the Messiah that they needed. And so um, Jesus is the goal of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. The bad news is that Israel was hardened against Jesus. When Jesus came along, when their Messiah came along, they should have celebrated. They should have uh, welcomed him with open arms. And it seemed that they had on, on Palm Sunday but they misunderstood what the Messiah was supposed to do. The Messiah wasn't supposed to die on a cross. He was supposed to um, liberate them from Roman rule. He was supposed to be a political figure. And so they refused to believe in Jesus as their Messiah. And so they were hardened against salvation. So Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 13, which we now take up, uh, they, it begins with the bad news for Israel, at that, and it shows that it's really good news for the Gentiles. The Gentiles did not have to become Jews in order to come to Jesus. So uh, you had to, in, in Jewish thought, you had to become a Jew in order to become uh, a follower of God. Yeah, and even among the early Christians who were mostly Jews, they, they thought that, that the Gentiles had to become 
um, Jews, or at least follow the law and do the religious traditions of the Jews in order to come to Christ. Paul says they didn't have to do that. They did not keep, need to keep the law to be saved because you couldn't keep it anyway. The Jews couldn't keep it. So they could come to God directly by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul begins his exposition highlighting the positive side of the fact that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes by taking one last look at the negative side. He refers to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, to show that if one expects to be made righteous by works of the law, then he has to keep the entire law. You can't be selective. You can't say, I'll just keep the top 10 and then uh, and ignore the rest. Or I can, I can slide on these if I keep these. He says, no, you have to keep everything. He says, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. So the, the point seems to be this. Now, so you want to attain righteousness by keeping the law? Fine. But you must do what is commanded in the law. Every single command. Perfectly. Good intentions aren't enough. 99.99% is not enough. Anything less than 100% obedience brings us up short of God's righteousness. And that the Jews didn't realize just how bad this news was. They, they believed they were privileged and secure and righteous before God. The news was even worse for the Gentiles because they weren't part of the club. And supposedly the only way they could be saved and become righteous before God was to become like Jews, to submit to the requirements of the law. And as it turned out, the law they submitted to couldn't save them anyway. But in verses 6 through 8, Paul does a short exposition of Deuteronomy chapter 30, 11 through 14 to begin to show how the gospel is available to everyone, to the Gentiles as well as the Jews, without having to keep the law, which they couldn't keep anyway. So Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, 11 through 14 is, is part of Moses' final sermon to the people of Israel before they cross over into the promised land. Uh, Moses begins the sermon in, in uh, chapter 29, verse 2 um, in Exodus uh, with a statement of the problem. He says, we have a problem here. Uh, so he says that the people of Israel have witnessed God's power and provision in bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. If you remember the story, uh, uh, God showed miraculous signs. There were 10 plagues that he um, inflicted on Egypt, and he showed a tremendous power, and, and a, he released people from slavery in Egypt. And he led them through the wilderness, giving them manna, giving them meat to eat, giving them, uh, providing for them. So here they are at the promised land. But they had not been given eyes to see. Their hearts had not been changed. They still grumbled about God. They still uh, didn't uh, follow him with their whole heart. So in verse 6, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 9, 4, don't say in your heart, don't say in your, your wicked, unrepentant, hearted hearts, this is what I'm going to do. 
And in the context of Deuteronomy 9.4, Moses is warning Israel not to think they are anything but stubborn and rebellious. Israel needed a change of heart before they could see the, the way of salvation. In its context, Deuteronomy chapter 30 then, uh, verses 11 through 14, refers to God's commands. The point is that you, you don't have to travel to the outermost reaches of heaven or sail the length of the seas to find out what God requires from you. You don't have to go on a, on a mystical quest. You don't have to go on a re religious pilgrimage. You don't have to, to, to work hard to figure out what God wants from you. He has delivered his commandments to you. It is as near as your mouth, Moses and Paul says in quoting Moses. It's as close as your heart. And Moses in the context, says you can do it. You can do these commandments. And that last part seems to contradict what Paul is saying in Romans. His point is you can't do it. And so it's, it's a, a curious thing for us. How, how, do we, how do we make sense of that? Well, it seems Paul is really using this text uh, by showing that um, it really anticipates that God will give them a new heart. He will give, change their hearts so that they are able then to know him and to obey him. They don't have it yet, but Moses says it will happen. And it's because God has delivered his word to the Israelites not because they went looking for it, not because they had to search for it. So the best explanation for Paul's use of the Deuteronomy 30 text is to think that he finds in this passage an expression of the grace of God in establishing a relationship with him. We don't go searching for God. God searches for us. God comes to us. And so God now brings his word near to both Jews and Gentiles. It's not just the Jews that have his word. The Gentiles have it too, or at least they have, are, it's available to them. So that they might know his son, Jesus Christ, and respond in faith and obedience. So, we, so Paul, um, in his exposition, his ex explanation of this says, we don't have to go uh, up into the highest heavens to bring Jesus down. Jesus has already come. He, he came in the incarnation. So at Christmas we celebrated that, the incarnation that says God is with us. He has come down from his lofty place in heaven. He's with us. And he says, you don't have to go down into the abyss. And here he, he kind of changes what it says in, in um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says, you don't have to cross the sea. And, but the abyss is, uh, kind of fits what Paul is saying. You don't have to go to the highest heaven. You don't have to go to the lowest depths. And really, the, in Jewish thought, the sea was the abyss anyway. They were scared of the sea. It was a dark, um, unknown place to them. They were a landlocked country. And so that, it was a mysterious place. But Paul says, you don't have to go to the abyss. You don't have to go down into the grave to bring Jesus up because he's already risen. And he has ascended. And he's still with us because the Holy Spirit is his spirit in us. And so he remains with us. And so is he is indeed. His word is in our mouth, in our hearts. The grace of God that underlies the Mosaic Covenant is operative now in the New Covenant. And just as Israel could not plead the excuse that she did not know God's will. So now, Paul says, neither Jew nor Greek, Gentile 
can plead ignorance of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. We have it. It's in his word. It's in the Bible. And people you know, all over the world have access to it. Some, some people don't yet, but we're working on it. But the point is, for Jew and Gentile, like the, the way to salvation and righteousness is to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That he has this power and is at work in us and through us. Because salvation comes from the word of Christ and not by works of the law, it is available to everyone. You don't have to become a Jew. You don't have to be religious. You have to come to Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord, following him, doing what he tells you to do. Paul makes this point in verses 11 through 13. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That is, if you believe in Jesus, you're, you're never going to have to, uh, you're not going to be embarrassed in the end. You're not going to be let down. When you die or when Jesus returns, you can, you can face him without shame. Because you've done what he has called you to do. Paul write, continues, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So it's not going to be a situation where you, know, uh, you call on the name of the Lord and, and he says, I'm sorry, um, you're not part of the club. He's already issued that invitation. So if you respond, you send in the RSVP, call on his name, you're going to be saved. It's a done deal. And when you do that, he bestows his riches on you. Some people reject the invitation because they think it's, you know, they, they have to give up too much. And they might have to give up a, a few of the things that they're doing, but when you consider the riches you get in return, it's, it's no contest. To turn down the invitation uh, is crazy. Just as there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile in the, ba in the bad news that all have sinned, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile in the good news that salvation is available to all. And the reason this offer is open to everyone is that it comes down by a word of grace rather than having to be earned by works of the law. Because if, if, if you had to earn it by works of the law, then not everyone could get there. Not everyone could receive this gift. And when you realize no one keeps the law perfectly, that means no one would be there. The Gentiles did not have the privilege that the Jews had in receiving and knowing the law. So that appeared to leave them out of the club. People outside the church today don't have the religious privilege, the, the Bible knowledge, or the moral respectability even to, to take a stab at doing works of the law. So if acceptance with God depended on these things, Christianity would be an elite religion. It would be an exclusive club, much like Augusta National, much like the Jewish religion. But because it comes down by a word of grace, it is for all sinners without distinction. Now, 
how does this apply to us? You know, we, we look at this and we say, well, you know, we're not Jews, so we're not, we're not excluding people. Maybe we are. Because sometimes Christians, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes even intentionally, give non-believers the impression that they need to measure up to our standards, which we assume are God's standards, it's not necessarily the same thing. But they have to reach our standards in order to become part of us. You have to be respectable. You have to, you have to be like us. You have to uh, sing like us. You have to like the things that we like. Do the things that we believe are respectable. Our actions toward non-believers often is that they need to straighten up before they come to God. They need to go to church. They need to read the Bibles. They need to pray. They need to keep the Ten Commandments. And then some. Even some of the rules that we sprinkle in. So it's like telling somebody they need to clean up before they take a bath. Which is ridiculous, right? You think about that. The whole point of taking the bath is to get clean. Our message to non-believers should never be morality without Jesus Christ. We should, we, we cannot be entirely moral people without Christ. You can't do it. Experience should make that obvious. It's hard enough to be moral with Christ. We, we, we shouldn't have people measure up to our standards because our standards are far too low. We must always offer people Jesus, the Savior, as God's provision for our rescue. We lead with Jesus, not with morality. We must be careful that our beliefs and our actions do not generate into mere moralism. Our message to our children and youth should never be just be good boys and girls. Our message to non-believers should never be straighten up and follow the rules. We should always lead with Jesus. Because without Jesus, children and youth cannot be good boys and girls. And unbelievers cannot straighten up and follow the rules. The church is not an exclusive club intended for members only. God's offer of salvation and eternal life is available to all. And we should not intentionally or inadvertently give people the message that they, they have to follow our rules in order to accept the invitation. We should not attempt to shut a door that God has opened. And we also must avoid trying to create our own path to God by being moral people and keeping God's law. We must keep Jesus front and center. We must our, fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. Jesus the Messiah has always been the one way to receive salvation and to become right with God. Even in the Old Testament, because Jesus said himself, all, all the things in the Old Testament pointed to him. They didn't know it was Jesus, but they knew that it was the Messiah. And so Jesus has issued everyone an invitation. He's issued you an invitation. And hopefully you've, you've, <coughs> you've received that invitation and you've accepted it. But be sure that you're not trying to maintain a relationship with Jesus by just keeping the rules. You need to stay in the relationship. And he encourages all of us who have received and accepted the invitation to issue that invitation to everyone else we know. 
so that they too can have salvation. Let's pray. Gracious God, it is a privilege to be invited to your your party, your, um, your celebration, to be invited to salvation and fellowship with you forever. God, you are so awesome and so far above us that we could not presume to, to come into your presence without an invitation. So that's what makes it so remarkable. Then you invite poor sinners, abject sinners, to come. Without money, without price. You don't call just the rich or the famous. You call all of us. And we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace your rich mercy. Thank you for bestowing your riches on us. And so I hope, Lord, that everyone here, everyone online is, has accepted your invitation to come and to abide in you. And Lord, I pray for our friends, our family, neighbors, acquaintances, who do not know you, that um, they will not only see in our lives that we follow you, but they will hear from our lips that you are the way, that Jesus is the way to salvation. And that they can, they can accept that invitation because it's issued to them. So thank you for drawing us into your presence. Help us to live in the fullness of of your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And in his name, we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think most of us in this room probably are of the age and generation where we uh, have heard a lot of Billy Graham. I know when I was um, a young Christian back in the mid-70s, that was at some of the height of his ministry. And at the end of every crusade and every meeting of every crusade, he issued this invitation, just the same as what we read about today. And I can't ever think about hymn number 357 without thinking of Billy's booming voice and his invitation to come to the altar and to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so uh, in thinking about this passage, I thought it was just fitting that we sing some of the verses from Just As I Am. The first verse, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. So we can't come with a plea bargain like some uh, people come to uh, when they're in the court system. We have no plea except that the blood of Jesus was given for us and shed for us. And so that is what we bring to the altar is that invitation that God issued to all of us. So as we sing this, Answer the invitation like the refrain says, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. So let us stand and sing. We're going to do verses 1 through 3 and 5 of Just As I Am. Just as I am.
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.